Let's, uh, let's just quickly start here. I w I'm going to cover membranes. I just wanted to quickly point out uh, one, one important interpretation of some of the plots yesterday. And this is also more sort of as an example or as a case study of what we did yesterday to verify that your understanding is appropriate. So if you can, if you can answer the questions we're looking at in this um, interactive problem, right now, then you've got a really good understanding of the cyclone topic and grade distribution. So let's just quickly recap what we were looking at yesterday. We've got a feed coming into our cyclone, and we've got two streams leaving, the coarse stream, and we've denoted that as MC often. And then over here, we've got our fines, MF. And yesterday's class was about deriving this grade efficiency curve. So for a given cyclone, we can calculate a g of x curve given size fraction x. So x is your particle size and is in microns. And it has this typical S shape. And we'll see this actually in membranes as well. So understanding these curves and their interpretation uh, comes all, all in all topics of separation processes where you're dealing with a distribution of, of feed. So g of x then tells us what particle sizes report to which part of the system. And you'll recall that g of x essentially, um, if we had to write the equation in words, is the mass flow, or just mass, in the coarse stream of size x, okay, divided by the mass in the feed of that same size. So that's the English interpretation of it. It's the ratio of the particle size in the core stream over the ratio um, over the mass coming in in our feed. And so it makes sense then that our very largest particles have an efficiency of one because those very large particles report out in the coarse stream. And our very fine particles over here on the left of the distribution, they report to the overflow, so they don't report in the, to the coarse stream. And so those, uh, the g of x curve is down to zero. So this is where we're going now with this problem. If we have a single cyclone operating in this way, this may not be meeting our needs. This, this is very, very much the norm. A single cyclone will not be able to achieve the separation requirements that you'd like. For example, we might be getting material here in the fine that we don't want there. We would prefer that solid material that's currently coming up to the fine stream to be reporting down to the coarse stream. Okay, so we would like to improve our efficiency of the cyclone. Another way of saying that is we would like a lower cut size. We, a cut size tells us where 50-50 goes to the overflow and underflow. We would like to get a lower cut size. Or we might want a sharper cut so that that slope of the cut is steeper. Um, so for all these reasons, we might want to explore sequencing a variety of cyclones. And that's what I'm going to look at today. The other concept I want to look at is related to efficiency and pressure drop. So perhaps before we go on and talk about sequencing, I just want to emphasize this equation over here. Let's just go look back here. It says that the Euler number is a constant recall for a given cyclone. So if we rewrite that equation as delta P is the Euler number times rho F V squared over two. Now, the right-hand side over there has a, has a special interpretation. You'll recall from physics that a term that has this sort of structure is essentially momentum. It's a momentum expression. Okay, so it's telling us how fast the, the momentum the particles have, the velocity times the density of the fluid there. It's essentially a momentum number. So the Euler value tells us how efficiently we're able to convert pressure drop into velocity. So if Euler number was 1, you'd have 100% efficiency. Every change in pressure drop gets converted to velocity. And that's never the case. Right? We're always going to have some frictional losses over there. But the reason why I want to point that out is because delta P, our pressure drop, is 
proportional to the velocity squared. This equation shows us that proportionality. The proportionality constant is the Euler number times the density over 2. Okay, so delta p is proportional to the velocity squared. And the reason why I point that out is because earlier on in the slides, we had this statement up here. Let's just read through this again. It says, the pressure drop is our most important factor in affecting the, the unit's operation. If we increase delta p, we get increased efficiency and increased recovery. Okay? So we would like to increase delta p. So that means we would need to increase the velocity. Right? But there's a problem when we increase velocity. The moment you're going to increased velocities, you're going to be abrading that cyclone a lot faster. That's momentum, right? Increased velocity, increased momentum, you're going to start scouring away that cyclone a little faster if you want to go to higher delta Ps. Higher delta Ps also costs you money. Right? There's the converse, that if we feed our material to the cyclone at lower concentrations, so more dilute solids, we get greater efficiency. But that works against this, because when we want to dilute our solids, we're now essentially adding air. We're diluting our solids by adding ex excess air to the system. But remember we said yesterday that one of the ways we can deal with this is to split our feed Q into multiple cyclones. So we now have a bank of cyclones over here, each one receiving less, less volumetric flow, lower velocity. Okay, so there's a bit of a, a counterplay. It's not obvious how we're going to deal with this. We want increased efficiency. We can then go and up the velocity. But to run these units efficiently, we often split our feeds, and that reduces the velocity. Okay, so what we end up doing then is what I'm going to talk about next here. So I want you to think about, about this problem. This is, this is where um, the learning comes in today's problem. What if I take this cyclone right now, as it's running over here, and I'm not getting the efficiency I'd like? In other words, I'm getting solids in my overflow that I would prefer not to be there. I prefer those solids. Instead of being in MF, I would like them to be in MC. So instead of tampering with the velocities and the volumetric flow rate, one thing we commonly do is we feed that material to another cyclone. And let's call that MF2 now. Let's call this MF1. And this stream here we'll call MC2 and change that to MC1. So two cyclones in series, and what we're doing is we're taking the overflow from the first cyclone and sending it as the feed to the second cyclone. So consider that process for a minute. And I would like you to calculate g of x for the overall system. So what is the grade efficiency curve going to look like now? for this overall system. So an overall mass balance on the system, still the same feed M, but now my fine stream is MF2. My coarse stream is the sum of these. So blend these two streams together, and that's now my coarse stream. Okay, what does G of X look like for this overall system? Take a minute or two, think through what this equation is doing, what this system is doing, and superimpose on top of this white S-shaped curve what the new curve would look like for the combined system. Is it going to stay the same? Is it going to shift? And which way is it going to shift if it does so?
Okay, so if you get this answer right, you, you understand what cyclones are doing and you understand this topic. So this is a good test of your knowledge. Okay, so I see a lot of hand gestures, see a bit of discussion. Maybe think of it this way. At the very largest particle size, where is that curve going to end up for the new system? For very, very large particles. We still have to end up at 100%, right? So the largest particles will still the curve will still be at 100% at the end. Okay, so that, that part's okay. Let's, are we clear that the curve is not going to be the same? Okay. Maybe I'm going to give you another minute or two on this problem. I'm going to ask you to look at it from a different perspective, and this will help answer it. So what I'd like you to do is, on a piece of paper, do the following. Consider the particle size distributions in microns and consider this to be the feed. So that's the feeds distribution. We saw in a previous class that if we wanted to split that up, the distributions typically would look something like like that for the one distribution and let's see if I've got some other colors here. So is this the overflow or the underflow? The red curve. Overflow, okay. So this is M F1 and the underflow this curve might look something like that. Okay, so this would be MC1. Now can superimpose onto that plot what the second cyclone is doing. Okay, so the second cyclone is essentially taking the red curve and splitting it further. Everyone agree on that? So we're taking MF1 and that's being fed to the second cyclone. And so what we'll get is this splitting up perhaps like that. This would be MF2 in green. And then I'm going to switch back to blue for the coarse portion. Okay. So here in blue would be MC2, the coarse portion from the second cyclone. So the blue curve plus the green curve add up to give you back the red curve. Okay. So what I'm asking you then is essentially the coarse stream now, leaving the entire system, is the black curve MC1. So there's my first coarse stream and my second coarse stream in blue. So black and blue added up together might give you an overall distribution that that's as follows. Okay, so that's my coarse stream, leaving the overall system, and the red stream is my fine stream, MF2. Oh, sorry, the green, I should say, is my fine stream, MF2, leaving. 
So now do you get a better sense of what this overall system's grade efficiency curve might look like? Okay. Essentially, we're taking all this coarse material and sending it to our underflow, and that becomes my numerator here. So the numerator in this, in this equation now becomes a larger value. For a given particle size, the numerator becomes a larger value. The feed stays the same. And so what we expect then is this curve to shift to the left. Okay. So you might see that another way you can see that intuitively is let's say take my fine material that's gone up over here. It's getting a second chance in, in a cyclone. So some of that fine material is going to come down. So I'm essentially recovering my fines a little bit more. And what that says is that this curve must shift over to the left. So for our cut size, for example, so g of x equal to 50%, my cut size then shifts over. So I'm essentially saying I'm now recovering a smaller particle size overall in this system. <coughs> yes, Sean? Okay, it's a good point. It shifts and actually goes up. It bumps up because now there will be eventually some particles that you will always see in the core stream. So, okay. so we're not going to recover all our finds. Okay, so that's, a, that's a, an important point. It's here on the slide, in fact. Um, if we go to this curve, shows you that sort of setup now. So this is slide 26. Shows for a single curve... For a single cyclone, we might have a certain g of x curve. As we add two cyclones where we're connecting the overflow, that curve shifts to the left and bumps up. So what this says is, it, let's, for example, assume g of x, as it tends to smaller particle sizes, goes to 10%. That implication is that 10% of the very smallest size fraction there is always in your course stream. You're not able to remove those fines. So this isn't, a, this isn't a, a great thing necessarily by putting these cyclones in series. Sure, we're getting a, a, be, a smaller cut size, but also we're sending some of our fines out there, and that may not be desirable. But it depends on the situation, whether you want total solids removal or not. Now, here's the other point I want to make, is we can also do the following. We can take our cyclone, and feed back the overflow in a recycle. Okay. So if we think carefully what that does is we're diluting our feed with mostly air over here. This stream is some solids but mostly air. We're bringing it back and sending it through the cyclone. Okay. So what this does is it dilutes the feed but it still gets us that high velocity that we're looking for. Right? Because we're now sending a greater flow through the cyclone, that's more dilute. It's a win-win situation. We're getting dilute feeds, that improves our efficiency, and we still get higher velocities because we now have lots of material that we're recycling through. High velocities lead to higher pressure drops and higher recoveries. Okay? But again, it's not, there's diminishing returns with this on that recycle flow ratio. So there, with, that's essentially saying um, no recycle is curve one, Curve two is you're, you're doubling your recycle rate. Curve three is you're tripling your recycle rate. So diminishing returns there for that. Okay. So I just wanted to, to point that out for you so that you're thinking about not just a cyclone on its own, but seeing these units as part of a series. And in fact, that's always how you will discover them in practice. When you work at a company, you will see an entire bank of cyclones and the flow sheets that they're connected up in are sometimes fairly uh, counterintuitive. Okay? But if you think through it in the way that I've just shown you here for these two cyclones, you can apply that thinking to most configurations and anticipate what the effect will be on the system.